not a kind of a research which all of you guys are doing. Uh, maybe I should call it something else, but this is actually a practical something. It is in the form of a code, uh, uh, a code repository, a re uh, recipes, and in, in a form of a practical web application. So this is not typical research, which uh, you know uh, most of you folks are actually uh, uh, brilliant in. I mean, I'm not like that much into a theoretical like a research paper kind of a research. This is actually was a research of different aspects of an enterprise class application. So when we have to develop anything like this, you know, in, in, uh, if we have to develop an enterprise class web application, uh, there are many aspects we need, to, we need to take care of. So what I did uh, over the past few years is that um, I researched, uh, I divided these aspects into four parts. And then I researched in, on these aspects individually. So as a result, um, I have this website, which I call the aspectseries.com. The reason I call it like that is that it is actually explaining different ex aspects of an web, uh, enterprise grade web application. And it's not just explaining, there is an actually practically running web application behind it. Um, which was the result of this research. So I divided this research into uh, four categories. There's a client side, like I showed you here or here. And then there is a server side. And then all of both of these things are on, on cloud. So there's a cloud aspect of it. And then there is a maintainability aspect of it, which I which is named as Dev, uh, DevOps. So what I'm going to do here is that first I will try to explain what's the, what's the problem it is solving. So whenever somebody thinks of developing an enterprise grade application from scratch, from bottom up, they run into the problem like, what are the best practices? Uh, where should they begin from? You know, everyone wants to write an application that is sustainable, that is maintainable, that is scalable, that is fault tolerant, that can withstand uh, security issues, that can, you know, scale to 100 users to a million users in a click of a button. And if you are um, viewing that site from Pakistan or America, you want a similar experience. All of these things require a great deal of understanding of various aspects of an enterprise class application. So what's the problem? The problem is that being a software person or software developer, when I want to research on a best practice of something, let's say I want to do a multi-factor authentication, right? We know what is multi-factor authentication is like, you know, whenever you're trying to authenticate with a phone, you get a message on the phone and then, you know, you authenticate on a website and these kind of things or something like CAPTCHA or stuff like that. So let's say this is one of aspect, one of the security aspect of an enterprise class application. Whenever a developer tries to research it, they will find there are many ways people are doing it, but there are a few best practices. And whenever they try to copy the code or write a code on a best practice, there are so many, there are so many aspects that those best practices are never implemented in a real world application. There is always a hello world kind of an application, or you can say a to-do kind of an application, or a minimum possible implementation of that best practice. But that best practice is never glued together in a real world application. So what I did was that I took time and researched on these aspects of an enterprise class applications individually, and then wrote an application out of it. And this is not an ordinary application. This actually looks like this. So what you see here is actually a practically running application. It is a fictitious bank, which I call a BB bank. And it has all of these aspects, which I mentioned, which I will explain, uh, like briefly go through. Um, they, are, uh, they are mentioned here. So this is actually um, a running application, which came out of this, uh, this um, uh, research. So you can transfer, you can transfer funds here. You can deposit funds here. There, there are, you know, uh, 
grids here. These are very complex topics of web applications and stuff like that. Okay, so uh, so I divided these aspects into four categories: client side, server side, cloud, and DevOps. So in the client side, uh, one of the aspect was um, project structure and initialization. So we want our um, one of the important feature, one of the important thing in a development is that you want a very good project structure. Uh, I mean, this is an example of a project project structure, like you know how the files will be maintained, how the different applications will be maintained and stuff like that. So that, you know, people who are working in collaboration on a particular project, they can understand where is something. So that is that, that is project structure. Modularity. Uh, when you're talking about enterprise grade uh, modern applications, you want your applications to be loosely coupled. And there's a concept in single page application that only the part of application that are required uh, at a particular time, only that part gets loaded from the server and rest of the part are loaded on demand. So these kind of features uh, comes under modularity. So all of these things are uh, in that application, which I mentioned, and then you want data grids. So uh, the data grids you want, you want these data grids. This, this is an example of a data grid. You want uh, searching, sorting, filtering, pagination, server side pagination and different things in a data grid. Um, so all of the best practices of all doing all of these things are also part of this uh, uh, code base, which I have. And then uh, you want some excellent um, uh, form validation. So form validation is what if you write something on a form, like for example, uh, like this, this is a form. So if you write something on a form, and you want that to you know validate from a server or you want it to validate from the client side so this is also one of the aspects uh, which was cleanly uh, researched and applied on this application so uh, i i will go through a few of these aspects okay so there is one of the major aspect which is called state management state management is an aspect of an uh, of this kind of application where for example um, something changes in one part of an application for example, uh, I change something, um, you know, uh, uh, here in this part of application. I also want the, the same thing should be changed in this graph and this graph and this graph. If I will not implement proper state management, what will happen is that all of these different components of this page will give an individual hit to the server. Instead of that, one of the components hit, give hits to the server and the result that comes back is get injected in all the components that want similar kind of attack. So this kind of concept also make this application very fast, very responsive, and very loosely coupled and clean uh, um, as comparison to older applications. Same way we, uh, I have a concept of real-time push. So what is real-time push is that normally what happened is that a client, a browser, makes a call to the server and server tells, okay, here's what you are looking for, right? That's something which normally happens in a web application. But uh, what happened with the technologies like SignalR or we can say WebSockets is that if something is happening on the server, uh, like a stock exchange, uh, you see when you're looking at a stock exchange uh, on a, a stock exchange rates on a browser, it's not happening like there is a website and the website is asking, do I have a result? Do I have an update? Do I have an update? No, this is called pooling. We are not doing pooling here. What's happening here is that a server, when it has an update, it, it pushes its update to all the connected clients. So believe me, what happens in this application is it's so amazing. Like for example, a bank manager is looking at everybody's account balances. And a person with the name uh, John Smith uh, withdraws five thousand dollars, uh, five hundred dollars from her, uh, from his account. Only this particular row of this application, and only this particular column of this application will be changed. So a very tiny packet from server to the client will arrive, and only this particular area of the web application will be changed. So imagine an application with this much um, engineering involved into it, 
how much of this kind of an application uh, will be, um, you know, responsive and fast and, uh, you know, uh, highly available. So I also take care, and then there is a concept of model view, view model. I mean, I don't uh, have time to, you know, go through all of this. I took care of code quality, which is one of the major aspects, and then automation testing. Then I go come to the uh, thing which is which is like server side. On the server side, I researched on something called a service-oriented architecture. So what is a service-oriented architecture is, most of you might be familiar with it, uh, is like um, we divided the business logic into loosely coupled services. For example, if I'm developing a calculator, um, I, actually, I'm sorry, I should stop here. I mean, do we have any questions still till here on the on the client side? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. We are listening. Okay. So on the server side, um, I researched into service-oriented architecture. Uh, my master's thesis was on domain-driven design, so I was uh, I was was arguing whether should I write the code in domain driven design or should I write a service oriented architecture. There are pros and cons. There are different uh, uh, reasons, but I ended up working more on the server side architecture. So what happened with service oriented architecture is that we divide the business logic into loosely coupled services. And uh, with the principle, the theoretical principle, which I'm following here is called uh, with uh, single responsibility principle. Every service has just one and one job only. If it has to do something else, which is not part of that particular service, it dependency injects that service from outside. So there's a the concept of dependency injection and there's a the concept of uh, service-oriented architecture and loosely coupled architecture. So for example, if I am writing a, 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 a function to calculate a salary. So that function will only calculate a salary. But if that function has to send an email after calculating the salary, there will be another service called the communication service. That service will be injected here. And then that's, uh, and then I will say, okay, you know, do your job separately. So this way, uh, the architecture of this research is very loosely coupled and very, you know, uh, following the approach of single page application. Then I'm also following transactional data access. Like for example, I can show you the screen. You, you see this screen, uh, this screen, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when I have to uh, transfer data between two users, um, you know, I will make two database calls. One database call will subtract the amount from this user, another database call will add the amount of this, this user. But I want to make one database hit in a transactional way. So I'm pretty sure you, all of you are familiar with the concept of transaction. So all of these changes that happen during this uh, span of time goes to the server in one go. And then uh, if something went wrong in the server, of course it will roll back. So all of that theoretical concept was implemented here as well, practically. Uh, and then I have server side validation, error and exception management. This is also one of the very important topic. So server side is a very complex stuff. So if anything happens on the server side, I want a very uniform error to be propagated from server side to the, to the client side. Uh, so uniform, by uniform I mean, I want a same JSON structure coming from server to the client. So that was also implemented logging, how to do logging, the proper logging at what level, uh, and then authorization. Um, I am using Azure uh, cloud authorization here. So whenever you log into the application, it sends a message to your phone and then you get, or you can get authenticated from a Facebook. So you have, or social media and stuff like that. And then I have asynchronous programming. Um, I mean, I'm pretty sure you know the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. And real time push, one of the most recent thing which I just implemented yesterday, uh, I already explained you is the, is the real time push. It's like, for example, a bank manager is, is, is just looking at a graph and somebody deposited their money, uh, like from here. So the moment they deposit the money, the graph will be updated. Like I mentioned before, this is a concept of uh, web sockets which is implemented through technology called SignalR. 
So all the changes happening in the database are, are being injected from the server to the client, not from the client to the server, but when a server gets an update, it knows which are the connected clients I want to push this information to, and those graphs gets updated um, live. So that's also happening in this application. And then I also did security. There are many security aspects I took care of, like practically took care of these aspects, like cross-site request forgery, and then HTTPS communication, and how to do certificates and stuff like that. For authorization, I'm using JSON Web Tokens. Uh, it's a modern concept of authorization. Uh, a client gets authenticated from an authentication server, and then it gets a uh, it gets a token like this, which um, looks like something like this. So this is this is a token it looks like. It's an instructed token. This, this gets from the authentication server, it lands on the client side, and then from the client side, it gets injected in every HTTP call. So when a client make an HTTP call to the server, uh, this token is actually a part of that call. And then server knows that the person who is talking to me is an authenticated person or not. So the very researched and, you know, uh, research or uh, authentication mechanism were involved. And then I have versioning and documentation and code quality. After that, the, the third or the most, my, one of my favorite aspect was the cloud aspect. So I won't really want all of you to listen to this one. I mean, I, you, you're gonna you're gonna like this one, uh, uh, the, the cloud part of it. So like I already told you, I'm using Azure Active Directory. Um, uh, so I mean, you guys are in university right now, right? So I'm pretty sure you will have their your username and password from uh, your first name, dot your last name at the rate of your university domain dot com, and they will be in some Active Directory. So there is a cloud version of Active Directory which I'm using here. So when my client client application log, logs in, it goes to that cloud version, get a JWT token, and that inject that token. And then I am having uh, auto scaling. So for example, I am sitting. Uh, everything is in the cloud right now. All of these client side and server side I explained is in the cloud. So just imagine that I have I have a web application, which is like for example Amazon.com. And there is a, a Black Friday coming. You know, Black Friday in America is like one of the very, where people do a lot of online shopping and everything. Only for those two days, I want to rent high, more computation and more storage, only for those two days. So cloud have these capabilities to rent computation. So the, the concept here is renting a computation, renting a storage, only for the time period you need it, and then you rent it out and go back to normal. So these kind of features are also applied in this application. There is an app inside. If something ro goes wrong in my application, um, I, I'm actually, uh, I will try to actually log into app inside and cloud and show you what app insights look, looks like and you're gonna love it. Um, so actually this is what, where I'm logging into my, um, some other application, but uh, let me show you, where is it? Mm, okay, application insights. So you see, if something happens in my application, it is telling me what are the failed requests, what was the server response time, what was the server request time, what was the server availability, and I can even do live metrics. Like I can run this live metrics, and I can perform things on my application. And if something goes wrong, it suddenly will pop up here. I mean, because right now application is not running, so there is nothing running here. It will give you how much CPU are being used, the memory calls, memory failures, everything will be shown here live. And then there is a failure tag. I can go and check failures. So these are the failures happening. I can go check failures from previous month, previous week, previous day. Where was something failed? What sort of exception was were happening in my application? So these things are called app insights. This, this is the feature of cloud, which I'm also using here. And then, so you see, I'm saying there is a, there is a 25 SQL errors. And uh, frankly speaking, I didn't knew that they are there. <laughs> so I'm going to look into this error after this call. So it is, when I click here, it is telling me that uh, 
um i made a call and it is like, like time of expired something something and then it is giving me a complete stack trace which line number which function failed in which code which part of the code what failed everything is coming here so this is also one of the this is just one of the aspect of enterprise cloud application that you want to do a very good diagnosis and very good uh, you know uh, understanding of what's happening in your application while your application is in production so you can do preemptive measures against your application same way i there is a concept of server less architecture which i have applied here using a your functions i mean so you know what each one of this icon there could be a book on it i mean there could be a book or a series of lecture on just one of these things but the idea behind my research was to actually research on these things individually and then combine them into a real world application you getting my point that was the idea so this is not a depth of knowledge if you go outside and you want to learn angular there will be many courses on angular if you want to learn azure there will be many courses on azure if you want to learn asp.net core or any server side technology like java or other there will be many courses on that but i am converting my research into a practical course where where students will be developing this exact application from scratch and the idea behind is not the depth of a knowledge instead breadth of a knowledge so imagine a person who have knowledge and a practical approach on all of these aspects i haven't even completed yet so just imagine the amount of knowledge they will have if they will be able to practically know how to do these all of these things so that's the goal behind this research that what i'm doing right now is converting it into a course um i also have caching and security you know uh, caching um you know you cache something on the server side and then you remove it from the cache whenever you want so what are the best practices of that and then how to do inscription and data protection um uh, when it comes to cloud everything in the cloud is very protected we have something called key vaults so these are the key and we have our certificates um and secrets in key vaults and then if you open everything is inscripted this is not the real value but it's an inscripted value and then you i mean it will not even show you the original value i mean it can show you but i won't show you because it's a complete secret so but everything all the settings in my applications are available secretly and then available in different so that is also one of the aspect uh, and then universal configuration and then the entire database of this application is hosted in the cloud and then um, i am using continuous integration so whenever i build my code it uh it runs on the production developer environment and the qa environment so i have three environments so it, it runs and then for example if i want a qa a quality assurance person to perform something on my code they will change those things and then i will click one button and everything goes to the production and then i also have geo redundancy where i want for example if um uh, um uh, i want my application to have its database so i am i am i am i i made my application for united states right but suddenly i figured out that many users are coming from pakistan so when many users are coming from pakistan i want my database to reside in pakistan as well and then i want uh, this distributed system to sync to be sync all the time so i don't have to worry about syncing all of the theoretical amazing things you already know about distributed system i'm pretty sure you guys genius about distributed system so people like you amazing people like you actually have implemented those distributed syncing concepts in cloud so me being a lame man i mean i'm not a scientific person like that so i don't have to do that research it is done by the cloud people so by clicking just one button all of my database gets geo geographically replicated in pakistan by just clicking one button so the people in pakistan will now hit their server from pakistan that's the same way you you see that facebook is you know always give you same experience from wherever you do so and there so these are all the aspects um i i was just going through very briefly so the basic concept of this uh, research was to actually you know 
research on all of these things, HTTP communication, data visualization, data formatting, automation testing, unit testing, many things. So I, uh, what I did was that I researched on these individual aspects and not just research, I actually injected it into a real world application, which is now in the process of getting converted into a practical workshop course or something. So yeah, that's all uh, from my side. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rasmusud. I would like to ask questions from audience sides, if anyone. Thank you so much. Okay. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ann Reddy Popo. Please uh, join us. Very interesting. Uh talk as well, quite early in America in Houston. Um, so uh, I know you've had a thank you for the invitation, first of all, and I really, really appreciate the enthusiasm of all the students, their masters and research students. Um, and I'm happy to share my experiences and you know, what my current thoughts are in terms of AI. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So the type of research I do is um, I'm quite evil. I'm not a very nice person. I may look nice, but I'm not a very nice person. So what I do is um, basically um, try to understand animal intelligence. So, uh, um, you know, how do animals recognize things? How do animals' brains work? So I basically cut animals' brains open, set up electrodes, and try to see how the neurons um, are activated uh, in, in these animals' brains, um, and then try to develop computational models. So it's slightly different in the sense that I'm completely immersing myself in biology a little bit, and then developing um, AI models. Um, but today I won't go too deep into, into those aspects because we, we have very short time. But hopefully I will leave you with some questions that will make you think about your own research or think about AI or think about AI applications slightly differently or in a way that um, questions the current methods. Um, and then you can develop probably new methods that are, you know, very useful to the AI community. So uh, let me um, go through some aspects here. Um, I'll just share my presentation, which is very light. It's not, it's not heavy, heavy on, on uh, uh, you know, the, the technology side in terms of, um, uh, you know, uh, going through the details of architectures, anything like that. Um, but I'm just going to share my screen with you in a moment. I think Rasu, Ras, if, um, I think you're still sharing your screen. If you can stop sharing your screen, then maybe I can start sharing mine. Yeah, yeah. sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you so much. Can you all see my screen now? Uh, you can. Uh, you can share, please. Thank you. Yeah, is that okay? Okay. Right. So, um, what I want to concentrate on, you know, uh, the whole. I mean, uh, well done to all the all the um, speakers before me who set the stage for what I want to talk about today. Um, Many of the aspects, you hear so much about AI, you know, so much AI can do this, AI can do that, and 
AI is a field you have to be in, that, uh, you know, you I can have share, Excuse me, Sorry? Can, you share, uh, can you please share your screen? Are you yeah. not able to see the screen? Yeah, we are unable. Okay. Yeah, better? Yeah, we can see now. Yeah, great. So as I said, um, you know, my research is about actually cutting brains open and seeing what happens in the biological neurons and then um, trying to understand and develop uh, artificial sy systems, computational systems. But as I said today, I want to talk a little bit about what's happening in AI really, you know? It, it is going to be an AI world. We have to be prepared, as everyone has said before. But what exactly is happening in the AI world and why do we need to question some of the um, technology that's out there? And why some of this technology will also become probably redundant? So all this effort you're putting into probably understanding current technology might just soon disappear and be replaced by something, something else. Um, so, it's kind of become a bit static here. Oh, yeah, there we go. So I will concentrate initially on the high reality of AI, the current applications. Um, I'll go through the hype um, and then go through the reality. Um, the, I know AI is an exciting field, but I'll try to paint a negative picture about AI probably. So let's look at some examples here. So what do we have here? The first thing says, what, can, what we can learn from the epic failure of Google flu trends so Google had this um, uh, great experiment that they, that they wanted to work on, which is basically to understand, you know, and predict epidemics like, like flu, um, which would have been very useful if they had predicted it correctly with COVID right now and Corona. Um, but they failed miserably. And Google is obviously, as you know, very big. They have all the data that they want. They have all the money that they want. And they have all the research in the world that they, that they can possibly have. So, um, you know, why did they fail so miserably? What, what exactly about it that has gone so horribly wrong? Um, you know, they are the AI experts of the world. The second example is um, Google's AI health screening tool claimed 90% accuracy, but failed to deliver in real world tests. This is in 2019, so very recent. Um, I can actually share, if I can find it. So this one here, um, says it's actually 28th of April 2020, so very recently published. So Google's AI health screening tool completely failed in real world tests. And then you have, um, you know, Facebook's head of AI saying that this field will soon hit the wall. He's basically saying that we are going to end with a dis a complete uh, block in terms of progress in this field. So such a promising time for AI. There's so many people coming into it. What, what's, what's happening in this field and why is this pessimism, why does this pessimism exist? Now, despite all of that pessimism, there's loads of applications um, that are actually already developed, being developed, being adapted, such as in manufacturing and industry and, and you know, 
uh, retail, you name it, it's, it's, it's there. Um, I won't go through, you know, all the details that are, you know, what all the progress that is being made or what IBM is trying to do, or American Express is trying to do, or KPMG or some of the oil companies. Um, you are well aware of these examples. So let's dissect this. Why is there such a excitement for AI and at the same time such pessimism from AI and such failures from AI from some of the big names like Google and Facebook um, who are investing big time in, in very cutting edge AI technology. So let's look at the AI journey a little bit and then try and answer some of these questions and see which direction research should probably go so that we can make a difference in, in the field of AI. So the historical aims of AI, um, as other speakers have said before, is human-like intelligence. So can we develop machines that are you know, as intelligent as humans, or at least can emulate some of the intelligence of humans? It started in the 1950s, and 70 years later, we have deep learning, and you know, everyone's in deep learning trying to understand deep learning and try to uh, develop uh, the systems further within that space. So one of the, you know, some of the applications that have been pretty promising are something like uh, Amazon recommendation engines, um, like you bought this shoe, so here are some more shoes. Is that intelligent? I'm not sure if that is intelligent because you know, you're buying a shoe. What is so intelligent about giving some more shoes? Question the intelligence. Political campaigns, we still couldn't predict. They still couldn't predict that Trump was going to win the elections and they got it wrong. Autonomous vehicles are being researched but they're still not available. Um, facial recognition systems that, that fail miserably and we don't have them um, in airports and public spaces. So many of these things that have shown promise still are, show, you know, are not really intelligent. They could easily be any lookup table. Um, they don't need, with the false rules, they don't need a lot of intelligence for the way the current systems are working. Now, as some of the other speakers have also mentioned the big data versus small data conundrum. Um, most of the applications today are centered around big data. So for example, deep learning uh, was necessary um, and you have mil you know, hundreds of layers, millions of neurons in each layer and all of this, basically because we have a lot of data. So a lot of data doesn't necessarily mean it is good data or important data or necessary data for an application. So for example, just a single individual uh, at the end of 2020 would have about seven devices per person. So name it laptops, um, phones, Fitbits, any other wearable technology that you may have. You know, you have about seven devices per person. Now that itself, and imagine just one person, how much data they generate and multiply that by all the number of people in the world. So you actually have a lot of data and then that is just people. Now, if you then use that for companies, corporations, governments, and so on, and countries, you actually have enormous data. Uh, and all of this data, obviously, um, the velocity at which we're getting this data is increasing. Every minute, there's so much data being generated. The variety of data is different. The, the veracity in terms of the uncertainty of data is also um, extremely uh, large proportion. And then you have, obviously, the exact volume of data as well. Um, if you can see here somewhere, it says 2.5 quintillion bytes. Uh, you know, you just imagine that number. Um, now, 
in terms of storage, um, we ask that computer storage is somewhere near terabytes. Um, probably now, you'll, you know, it's going to petabytes, exabytes, yottabytes, and zettabytes. So you actually have data uh, that will be um, counted in terms of yottabytes uh, and exabytes very soon. Um, I mean, even in even as individuals, leave alone corporations, governments, and so on, you have enormous data. Now, all of the recent developments, all developments are centered around how do we capture information from this data? This data is valuable. How do we store this data? How do we manipulate this data? And how do we use it within the AI sector to develop new models and, and make systems more intelligent? Um, so obviously, because of that, you have all this cloud technology, you know, growing quite a lot because you need a huge amount of cloud space to save all of that data. But my question is, is that enough? Um, or is that necessary even? Um, if you have uh, information about one banana, do you need 11 million bananas or 100,000 million bananas to save information about a banana? You probably don't need that. Um, and uh, I think even clouds not in, not enough. Soon you will need heaven and sky and hell and everything to store all of the data we are generating and we need for AI systems. So. So I wonder if this whole cloud technology space is just going to vanish soon and it's unnecessary and, and it's too much. And we actually don't physically have the space to save all of this data because the hardware isn't growing at the same speed as the software side of things. So they talk about quantum technology, quantum mechanics, you know, you know quantum computing and so on to try and make sure that these servers run really, really fast and you know the processing happens really fast. And I know some of your previous speakers talked about GPU. We need GPUs. Oh my goodness, you know, these things are slow. Universities need GPUs to you can't do things on CPU anymore. But what are we running on these GPUs? Um, 10 million examples of a banana? Do we need that? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, and is that what intelligence is? But if you're talking about artificial intelligence, is that what the meaning of intelligence is? A lot of data to understand one item. A lot of computing power to understand one item. And to understand that item, several iterations of it, going through GPU, consuming all this power, and it also isn't really green technology either. So coming, keep asking ourselves the question, what exactly is real intelligence? What is intelligence? Is the system that we are having at the moment intelligent? Um, so let's look at the other side of, of what, you know, the advanced in intelligence really are. Apart from cloud technology supporting the advances in intelligence, the other one obviously is, um, you know, uh, deep learning. Now I have a huge elephant here because deep learning is like a big, huge elephant with all these number of the data. Um, you have huge pre-processing efforts going on with the data. If you have million data points and you're pre-processing that data somehow using all the variables of those million data points within a system, and then, and then you have a network, an architecture to process and to understand and to assimilate the knowledge that's existing in these million data points, you have an enormously large network. People boast about, oh, our system uses 20 billion data points. 
it has collected uh, you know data from 2016 to 2020 or beyond that 10 years of data uh, we use all this cloud to keep it and we have gpus you know our results are extremely good trust me i can break it in one second all i need to do is just basically give one or two images that are slightly wrong and it will completely break down um is that development in ai is that the way to go um, why now is ai developed by google failing today um, is this because the deep learning systems that they were very interested in are actually failing are actually breaking down and actually are not meant for purpose. Um, just because you have large data and you're using it in extremely large architectures of, 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 of AI systems that are repeatedly needing thousands of iterations to understand something, does that mean that intelligence is captured? It really is. Why would you need that? You really could have an Excel spreadsheet with a lookup table. Like, look for Anne Redipo, it will look for it. Look for Dr. Kureshi, it will look for it. You know, look for, just go down and then look in the list and then pick it up. It's probably much faster and simpler. Um, so, yeah, there are questions that are being raised why deep learning AIs are so easy to fool is uh, the topic of an article that was published in Nature in October 2019. They're very brittle. As you know, they break very fast. They're very fragile. A slight change in architecture or slight change in the, in, in the input. So if you have, for example, lung cancer, um, and train a system for lung cancer, and then suddenly you change the images of lung, of lung cancer to, say, breast cancer. It is still cancer. It is still change in the cells. Uh, it's just that it's in a different part of the body. Just because the part of the body changed, or the number of um, uh, tests and training cases have changed, or the slight change in architecture, it'll just fail. You know, oh, this is meant only for lung cancer. We have not trained it for breast cancer. Exactly the same. So it is very, very brittle. It's very fragile. And it is very hackable. Hackable in the sense that you don't need to steal all of the data that's saved on Azure to hack the system. All you need to do is give two or three examples of a new image and it will break down. It will actually give you completely different results. So if you have autonomous vehicles, driving vehicles, and it's a public system that everybody, a common man uses, if someone hacks into that system, changes the sign of a signal on the road, it becomes completely unusable. So here are some examples that nature has actually mentioned. So deep neural networks are brilliant at recognition, but they can be easily hacked. So the first sign, they trained it for that stop sign, but they just put, if you can see, small just stickers. And it completely gave an output that actually said speed limit 45. That was the prediction when they put the stickers. So this was what it was uh, trained, King Penguin. They put these lines in the uh, di uh, image and the prediction was, this is a starfish. So these are guys from, you know, Oxford University, Cambridge, you know, California, Silicon Valley. These are like the best brains. And they could not get the AI to recognize this. If it has to recognize this, then basically you have to include all the examples of all the variations that are needed to actually understand and predict it correctly. 
Uh, <clears throat> here are some more ones. So that this is a stop sign. When they changed the orientation of it, it said that is a dumbbell, like the weights dumbbell. And then when they changed it even further, it said that is a racket, like a badminton racket or a tennis racket. Here we have a, a fly um, on a mat, uh, a dragonfly or, you know, on a mat cover. But it actually said it's a manhole cover when it's not. And here you have a mushroom that just fell to the side. So instead of standing up, it just fell on the ground and they said it's a pretzel. So, and these are, as I said, cutting edge technologists using the latest, latest DNNs that us common people don't even have access to, who are saying that these things are happening and they're failing and they don't know why they're failing. So, <clears throat> Um, but despite that, despite all of that, uh, there, are, there is still a lot of promise and every sector that you can name off, name, name, um, uh, have invested in AI of some kind, either in the development or in application within that field. So media, education, government and city planning, and so on. Uh, there, there's several, several, you know, these are just the some of the hundred companies or hum, uh, that, that are in the field. So <clears throat> let's dissect things for a minute and go, okay, okay, it's, it's fine, you know, those are weaknesses, but let's look at, you know, the overall picture of what, what the current AI technology get, provides us with. So you have large companies contributing like Google and Facebook and Amazon and all these people. So you know, we can, there's more progress, they're pumping in more money. Um, there's dumbing down of the programming in the sense that ready-made functions and libraries are easily uh, available, such as in Python and R, which is, which is a good thing, but which can also be a bad thing because people are using it without really understanding how these things actually work or what they're doing. And then there's accessibility and adoption. There's so many online courses, you know, uh, people willing to talk about it, you know, supply information and so on. Um, but the weaknesses, as we know, is one size does not fit all, even within the same field, even within the same sector. Um, and, you know, we know about all the weaknesses and we talked about it. We don't have to go through each one in detail. Um, but there are opportunities as well, such as it's, it's good, healthy investment uh, is pump, being pumped into in terms of money, in terms of actual resources. Um, people are thinking about innovation all the time in industry. They know that their current systems are not fit for purpose. And we have time to prepare for it. We, are, we all know the AI world is coming at some point and we're all preparing in terms of the education, what we need to have in our courses, courses, um, what we need to have within our own industries, um, what we need to develop, what we need to look for even in terms of the research. Um, some of the threats are about um, because people think AI is very super duper fantastic technology, they are expecting quick results. And when they don't get the results and they don't understand it fully, they are just going, well, we thought it was a really good system. It's not working. So we can't keep pumping in millions of pounds or dollars into this. So we're going to withdraw funding. Um, so lots of startups have their funding frozen. They have not got a second round of funding in their AI uh, startups. Um, and we have the question of ethics as well. So what we'll do in a little while is um, talk about some of these topics in, in, in detail. Um, but looking at some of the future trends and questions that arise about the future trends, we have chips being implanted. That is nothing new, by the way. One of our speakers in Warwick University, they have done it long time ago. 
and uh, you know it's being done with neuroscience so that is going to continue um, and it is something that uh, you know whether it's on your body or inside under your skin um, there will be chips that will try to gather information about what you're thinking who you're going to vote for you know uh, where your eye is lingering when you're watching a screen and all kinds of information such as that. And obviously there are good benefits such as healthcare. It can probably monitor your blood pressure and sugar levels and cholesterol and all sorts of other things that will alert to you, um, you know, if you have a serious condition. Um, but let's dissect one of the uh, very promising uh, or fast growing areas of, of tech. AI technologies, the self-driving cars. So it's not that difficult in the sense that you put all these cameras, all these sensors, GPS system, gather all the data, right? We got all the data. Um, now we can use an AI system, which is also what we have, a deep learning, net, learning uh, you know, technology, put all of this data through, get it trained, boom, it just drives itself. That's great. But what are the other things that we need to think about? So self-driving cars are a thing and they, they are coming into, they, they are trying to come into the market, but will these fail because of other human drive, drivers on the road? If an accident happens, what happens to insurance? You know, when you have any, any problems, you, do the insurance company say your algorithm, do they actually blame the algorithm that failed or the human thank you, uh, being? Thank you, Dr. Anne. Uh, we have a uh, short of time, please. Uh, this was uh, Dr. Anne Radipko, Director of Research from Aberdeen. Uh, anyone have questions from audience? I would like to ask if anyone has. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ready to go. Uh, that was our director research from Aberdeen. Thank you. Uh, you can conclude, please. Yeah. Dr. Ann, you can conclude, please. Thank you. Uh, now I would like to uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Hamad Qureshi. Dr. Hamad Qureshi, please join us. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Nuruddin uh, Lokel. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. All right, that's great. Uh, sorry for the delay. I, I was uh, I didn't realize I was muted, and then uh, I got unmuted and then muted again. So, um, so uh, let me just give me a minute to share my slides. And please, uh, please share your screen. I'm doing that, just a minute. Okay, and share screen. Yeah. Okay, can you share my screen? Oh, can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see. All right, perfect. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for organizing this and uh, especially Dr. Bajwa. I met him many years ago at a conference in Islamabad and, uh, and I thought it'd be, be great if I can contribute uh, to this conference. So um, I'll be talking about de developing and deploying uh, AI in, in healthcare. Um, so uh, the issue is uh, um, healthcare is, is, is one of the top um, places where you know, uh, uh, 
Western countries, uh, especially U.S. and so on, have have huge expenses, right? So, um, so and it, it's, it's going to increase as the as the population gets older. There are lots of challenges, uh, which means there are opportunities. And how can role, how can software and AI help? Uh, is is what I'm going to um, look into with with a case study on lung cancer and then uh, future of healthcare. So, so we come to the first topic. What are challenges and opportunities? Um, so in the 21st century, uh, the greatest great obstacles to, to medicine and healthcare. But at the same time, we are looking at, at, at a new revolution, a revolution in information, right? So the industrial industry revolution 4.0 is, is essentially an information engineering revolution. Uh, just as mechanical engineering uh, or uh, well, blacksmith's job was changed completely by the industrial revolutions of 2.0 and 3.0, um, similar stuff is going to happen here. Um, it, it's, uh, it's not going to be, I mean, uh, uh, you know, blacksmiths are still there, but iron is manufactured or steel is manufactured in, in these big um, steel mills. So in the same way, uh, information has to be uh, harnessed and managed in a way in this information engineering paradigm. Uh, but first, I would like to talk about um, what's, what's the most important issue in healthcare. Um, um, it's, it's actually a misdiagnosis, right? So uh, apparently, as per um, a white paper by clinical care, most Americans, America, which has one of the best uh, healthcare systems in the world, um, at, least, at least once in life, they will get um, an inaccurate, inaccurate diagnosis. Um, one in five will be cancer patients. Um, 12 million people uh, seeking outpatient care get, get diagnostic error every year. 10% uh, of the patient deaths, that is 40 to 80,000 people per year, is due to misdiagnosis or wrong diagnosis. Um, financial um, uh, impact is about 30% of annual health spending. Uh, $750 billion in the US are wasted because of misdiagnosis. Um, there's a big system breakup where there's no integration between different aspects of the health system, even departments like, like radiology and pathology. And most importantly, the human cost is gravitating. Um, uh, about 28% of, of cases where, where there was a misdiagnosis led to death or permanent disability. And that's in one of the most advanced medical systems in the world. So, what are the other problems? Um, medical facilities are suffering with a shortage in every domain, right? There's a severe shortage of medical professionals. Um, uh, uh, worldwide, by 2035, almost 13 million, uh, there'll be almost a 13 million shortage of, of people. In the three countries, about a total of 140 do not meet the requirements of WHO, which is 23 in a, in a 10,000. Uh, hospital beds, uh, we know in Pakistan, it's it's, it's be tricky to get um, beds in hospitals. The reason for that is that there's only 0.6 beds, 1,000 uh, people. In Canada, it's a better 0.9 beds per 1,000, but you know they are not too far. And for, uh, Greenland has, is, is the best where there's about 14 uh, beds per 1,000 population. The shortage of medicine, even in advanced countries. So th this is, should be this should be interesting for everyone. Uh, so if you if you look at uh, if you, if you can look at the table here, you can see that U.S. in U.S. almost in three different areas there was in availability of medicine, which is really striking between 2013 and 17. I mean, of, of course, it has to do with uh, logistics and laws and so on. But apparently, that that's even even a big problem in in, in developed countries, not in just countries like Pakistan. Um, you have Australia, again, there's availability in one category, and, and Canada uh, availability, uh, there's no availability in one category, and shortage in almost all, all other ones. So, you know, shortage in, in some of them, at least. What do we do? Um, how do we resolve these problems? And what are these problems exactly? The first, lack of staff, as I said, uh, not enough trained medical uh, uh, professionals. Uh, inavailability of medicines because of logistics, uh, ethical, um, cultural, um, even law uh, issue based issues, ineffectiveness of treatment. Many treatments are getting ineffective. If uh, if you guys, if you people are not aware, uh, we are severely the, the, the only uh, 
uh, treatment for tuberculosis, or most important one, BCG, is actually now failing. Um, uh, it, uh, even Pakistan has about 7 million chronic tuberculosis uh, cases, um, which, which are untreatable. Um, so that's another problem. We need new drugs, uh, we need new therapies that would overcome these issues. And most importantly, we need more precise instruments that would be able to help doctors uh, diagnose patients better. Um, without an X-ray, um, you know, finding a hairline fracture would be would be very difficult. Um, so, um, so that, in that way, uh, we we need we need better uh, equipment to to help the doctors. So, what do we do? Um, we, we of course bring in software and AI. We bring in the, the most uh, revolutionizing, um, uh, let's just say, technology of the 20th century um, in, in role here, and 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 that, and hope and and then that, uh, that is going to lower costs and increase effectiveness, as uh, I will prove, uh, as I will show um, in the next few slides. So. What's the current landscape? Where is the software being used? Um, patient data management. If you go to a good hospital uh, anywhere in the world, you you will if you're registered there, they will be able to uh, 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 you know uh, uh, get to your records, uh, which would have your entire history, and and uh, you could probably get some treatment. Um, emergency management. Uh, we have software that uh, uh, involving telehealth care, mobile healthcare. Which can which can provide um, healthcare in emergency situations and remote locations in an aeroplane or on a mountain somewhere, um, link it to to hospitals and and uh, uh, health institutes. Drug discovery um, we have software that helps big pharma to uh, develop patterns to understand uh, using simulations how to find new diseases, and finally uh, patient care and diagnostics. Uh, that's where it's it's slowly becoming uh, a common case. Uh, you can go to websites online, like Google, enter your uh, symptoms, and and, uh, and Google is going to tell you what, what you might be suffering with. Um, the same goes with Watson uh, by IBM um, and so on. So um, that's another thing that, that's right now uh, which can be used. What are the other themes in health development? Where, where are we heading? What's the future looks like? Um, so now we're going into pathology and radiology investigation, um, we, which are being automated using AI. Um, I'll be talking about that in a little while. Um, optimization and prediction, um, and containment, right? I mean, COVID-19 uh, 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 analysis. So countries who are containing them, who are tracking them, South Korea, they had a tracking software that could track um, where the patient had gone to, um, they had software to uh, or systems to uh, enforce containment. Um, uh, these countries actually did much better than the countries which, which decided to actually go for herd immunity or or even um, even uh, cure the disease. So optimization and prediction, uh, community health. Uh, that that's another thing with the help of AI uh, that, that's going to shape the future of healthcare. Uh, patient health tracking. Uh, you, you all have, have wearable devices, uh, like watches and so on, and uh, your mobile phone. It, it can actually uh, record uh, aspects or record features pertaining to your health. Uh, it can detect your heart rate, it can detect your sleeping patterns, or, uh, and it could actually get your pulse rate and so on. So this is another form of data that's very, very important, and that's going to shape how healthcare is administered, uh, administered in the future. So, uh, so that brings me to my uh, case study. Uh, Dr. Rekupu was talking about lung uh, lung cancer. Just a bit, uh, Dr. Ann uh, was talking about that just a bit uh, a little while ago. So I'm going to first establish the importance of why of doing this, right? So it's a disease that still kills millions annually. And what I'll be doing is uh, automated per proportion score for PD-1 cancer diagnostics, and we should use shortly know what that means. In 2017 alone, 1.88 million people died of lung cancer, out of a total of 9.6 million people um, dying of cancer overall. Uh, this is going to increase, and it's already increasing, especially because of aging population. The survival rate of lung cancer is around 19% in the US. So, uh, you know, eight out of uh, 
uh, and are, are going to die uh, within five years. Uh, in fact, sixty uh, percent, uh, six in ten actually die within the first year, uh, with a very low quality of life. Um, and and um, survival rates have, have not actually improved in the last five decades. It's been the same. So there's something probably we are doing wrong. Um, there's nothing uh, in, in probably in our life that we do as the same as we used to do five, uh, you know, five decades ago. So, uh, so what do we do? Um, so what, something new on the block is what we call immunotherapy or immunohistochemistry. And the field uh, of data that deals with that in terms of lung cancer is called PDL1 diagnostic. What happens is that if a, uh, if a cell, a tumor cell, develops something called P1 PDL interaction, which is also known as PDL1 interaction, in short, it basically uh, becomes immune to attack by the uh, protective cells, by the immune cells. So, every, you know, uh, all uh, diseases are actually killed by your immune cells. The, the, the medicine that you take or chemotherapy and radiotherapy in the case of uh, cancer um, actually uh, just helps your body uh, to, to, to get rid of the infection uh, or uh, disease like cancer. Uh, but what happens is the, the tumor actually develops this protective um, uh, uh, chemical of the immune system that this is these are normal cells don't kill them and um, so uh, as a result they keep growing and eventually they take over the lung and uh, we know the results so, so what we now do is like we detect the pd1 we try to find out what what amount of uh, pd1 is there how many cells are uh, resistant to immune cells we have different chemicals to do that uh, reagents sp263 22c3 uh, they are examples and the whole field is known as immunohistochemistry and immunotherapy, uh, that, which, which, are, which are the drugs that are used to treat it, are already helping people uh, get better lifespans, or, or, you know, greater lifespans and better quality of life. So, how do you know the um, uh, the tumor uh, is is, is PDL1 positive? So, basically, we do a staining, and when we stain the cells, we find that uh, the, the some cells have this brown um, uh, brown. Uh, uh, you know, uh, membrane around them, right? So brown stain membrane around them. But these cells uh, are actually uh, the bigger cells in this in this image are actually uh, tumor cells. Uh, so when the brown sur surrounds them, that means they have become resistant uh, to immune cells. So small cells around them are actually immune cells who are trying to attack these cells, but but they can't because these cells have, have actually developed this, this protective, uh, uh, you know. Uh, let's just say skin around them, and then uh, it, they can't be killed. Uh, whereas the, the cells on the left side, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, left side here in the center, uh, they, they have less of the stain. That means they, they are they've not no protection, but it, the, the cells on the edges here actually uh, can protect themselves uh, or are protecting the other ones as well. So um, how do we resolve this? So what the doctors do is that uh, in order to de define the treatment, they, they compute what we call the TPS score, or tumor proportion score. So they take all the number of positive, uh, they, they, they count the number of uh, tumor positive cells, and they count the number of uh, negative cells, they do a ratio of the positive to the total, num total number of tumor cells, and that gives them what's, what's the tumor proportion score. And they have a guide, uh, so if TPS is less than 1%, the guy gets no immunotherapy, uh, maybe a bit of chemotherapy, and if uh, and and the cells are expected, the cancer cells are expected to die. Um, I mean, this happens regularly in your body, right? Some some cells are gonna get out of function, they, they will die, and immune cells are, are gonna go into them. Uh, this between one and forty nine percent, where there's a bit of uh, tumor and uh, uh, um, uh, most of it is uh, negative, which means it can be killed by immune cells. And then, uh, but then when we get to much more than 50%, that's where uh, the person is pushed to uh, immunotherapy uh, or treatment using immunotherapy. Between one and 49% is also now, uh, FDA is also saying that we should, we should treat these patients as well uh, with, with the immunotherapy. Uh, it's as a first line of treatment, uh, it's, becoming so pop it's becoming so successful uh, that that's already um, uh, in the pipeline. What is the problem? Uh, if you are a pathologist, uh, probably uh, most of, uh, are there any medics in my, in my audience? Probably not. Yeah, okay. 
we can they are okay <laughs> okay so if there are medical professionals in my audience uh, you will know that uh, if you're given a pathology slide um, uh, just as one I'm showing here uh, there's a TMA core uh, these are two TMA cores uh, actually taken from the same resection and stained using the DL1 uh, now you can see, now what you have to do is to count all the cells, uh, the cells that are positive, the cells that are negative, and then do a ratio, right? So it's like counting the stars in the sky or hair on your head or someone else's head. And probably that's not something uh, anyone would appreciate doing, even if you are an expert uh, in, in the field. So, um, so how do you uh, do this, right? So it, it's, 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 it's insane to ask someone to do this on a regular basis, especially somebody like a pathologist whose so time is so important. But by the way, the, the TPS score for both these was actually 0%. Um, so how do we do this? So it comes in the neural networks. A lot of my worthy colleagues, um, starting from the first speaker, I think, no, the second speaker, uh, Dr. Tariq and, and so on have talked about uh, units, um, Dr. Paul. Uh, so I'll, uh, oh sorry, neural networks, so I'll not go into detail. Basically, I have an have a ensemble neural, neural network where uh, a structural layer uh, finds some um, uh, 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 result, finds some areas and then a cellular, I'll show you examples of that in a bit, uh, detects the cells, then they combine with AI algorithms and count the number of positive and negative tumor cells. Um, so, so what, what, what were the results? So when the structural detections come through, uh, my structural detector tells me which area has tumor. For instance, here, the yellow area is tumor. Uh, the blue area is macrophages. Um, over here again, blue is macrophages. Green is the background. Uh, detections uh, are here. So my neural network has detected all the cells uh, that are there and my structural uh, annotations has told me what areas are tumors and which are not. Let's go for results. Here, um, I, I show a core weight which is 100% positive. Uh, if you can see the red dots, that's where the tumor cells are. Uh, my algorithm says 99.7%. The uh, expert <coughs> pathologist said it was 100%. Uh, the uh, this in, in this one uh, the ground truth is 10%, which means that uh, it's 10%. TPS score is 10%. Um, you can see uh, a bit of cancer on on the top left, uh, just uh, edge there, and then a lot of green dots, which are like uh, tumor uh, negative tumor. So the ground truth is 10%. Detected TPS is 0.6%. Um, here uh, it's 40% uh, ground truth. Um, you can see that it doesn't depend upon the uh, number of tumor cells, it actually depends upon the ratio of them, how many are positive and how many are negative. Uh, you can see it's 40% here, um, uh, ground truth, detected TPS, my algorithm says 35%. And finally, this is 0%, all green dots, which means all the tumors are negative. And uh, uh, we have the agreement with the pathologist. Um, some qualitative results, so we did this for 100 cores here at NIB, Northern Ireland Biobank. We took 100 uh, different cores and we computed the results, um, uh, verified through three pathologists. Uh, you can see there's about 100% match uh, in the top 40, uh, almost half of them, uh, sorry, 35, 30, 35. And then there is variation, but apparently the doctors considered 20 to 30% 20 to variation as, as acceptable. So if we, uh, between them, if we look at that, almost 80 um, of, of the 100 cores have been, um, have been uh, classified correctly, irrespective of uh, whether they were 100% or 80%, 90% or so on. Is, I also computed the inter-class correlation coefficient and the Pearson correlation coefficient, which are as 0.88 and 0.89. Uh, recently, uh, a big startup, Path AI, uh, have millions of dollars in funding and uh, collaboration with pharmaceuticals. They published a paper and they have they 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 say that they have a 0.837 um, of of correlation. Average difference between the ground truth and the detected TPS was 10 percent. We further uh, so once we had these results in the lab, we decided to um, take it to a to a real world situation where a real clinic uh, would use them. Uh, so this one is Leiden University Medical Center in Netherlands. This is a company so. 
we ended up using it in a Dutch hospital. Uh, so, um, so, so um, normal, let's just say. Um, so, our, our algorithm was trained on TMS lights and resections, and it was supposed to look in, uh, into biopsies, which is absolutely, which is kind of like way, way different from uh, from TMAs and resection. Uh, so, any any uh, pathologist or a doctor would appreciate that. So in the first instance, they shared with us and blinded uh, very difficult cases. So the cases that they were finding difficult to grade and uh, or develop algorithms for. So they gave us the data, but they didn't share the GPS course. We performed our evaluation, and when we provided them provided them with the results, they came out to be 90% correct. So uh, they were really happy. They took our algorithm and they applied it on 200 different biopsies. Uh, it, it was there were very difficult, challenging data. There was metastasis, lymph nodes. There, uh, we acquired very visible results. Ninety percent cases had less than 10, so ninety cases had less than ten percent difference. One hundred cases had less than twenty percent difference, and one hundred fifty cases had less than thirty percent difference. The ICC was 0 0.075 and PTC was 0 0.078. Uh, they are currently work, extending the algorithm and making it even better. This is the graph showing the results. So when the orange dot and the blue dot come together, that means there's 100% agreement. Uh, when there's variation, there's a bit of a, a disagreement there, but obviously the pathologist's uh, results are not um, full truth, which means they also make mistakes. So, uh, so, um, so in that case, but, but our algorithm is going, uh, is going to uh, provide the same results and also the distribution for them. It will actually detect the cells and count them, which the pathologist actually cannot do or, uh, or uh, so, I mean, this is important in the sense that the same pathologist would provide actually different results at different times in the day. So for the same slide, uh, if you guys know, uh, know, like, you know, or if the two different doctors, they will give you two different diagnoses and that's very, very it's just considered normal. Uh, but algorithm is a superior in the sense that it will give you the same results every single time. Conclusions from our work, um, what can we do? Uh, we can provide decision support. We can provide algorithms that will help professionals make better uh, diagnosis, better decisions. Um, it can be faster. I mean, uh, the time it requires to read uh, a slide can, can be dramatically re uh, reduced uh, by order of uh, magnitude um, uh, sometimes. sometimes. Uh, so you can get quick results here in the UK. Uh, almost uh, ninety percent, ninety-two percent of the labs are running behind. Uh, that is, they don't have enough staff actually uh, uh, provide provide diagnosis in good time. Reduce the workload of the medical professionals. Um, uh, there's a lot of attrition in, in pathology and radiology. Almost one third of the radiologists and pathologists drop out of of uh, work because they, they they find it hard to. Uh, with with the workload or you know uh, the, the the sort of work they are doing, I find it very boring and uninteresting. Um, in fact, almost hate it. Uh, so uh, and of course we can use our, these techniques to provide better follow up because we are doing quantitative analysis and treatment can be more organized. And finally, uh, techniques like this can help in drug discovery to find new drugs uh, that can track the progression of these and help uh, create better treatment regimen. Oh, okay, I missed the slide. Did I? Uh, no. Okay. Oh. So, what's the future of healthcare? Um, ne next decade, we'll, we'll see a major transformation of healthcare. I, I mean, especially in the West, it cannot go on like this. Um, the, the costs are too high. Uh, the uh, misdiagnosis is, is is rampant, as I said, and it's it's going to and it's creating creating big um, burden um, on on societies here. So, uh, what do we see, or what we shall we see happening? Uh, the first thing around the corner is diagnostic decision support, right? Uh, I don't know how long it would take for countries like ours, or um, uh, you know, other countries in that part of the world. But uh, apparently, uh, Chinese uh, in twenty. 19 announced a five-year plan to automate or let's say computerize all of their healthcare um and it's a five-year plan so um so that's that's looking very interesting it will be very interesting to see uh, what that achieved um so uh there can be decision support using ai and there'll be quantitative assessment rather than 
um, a doctor coming up with a differential diagnosis, which which can be very subjective and qualitative, uh, it will become more quantitative. So you could be you could tell for what reason uh, what drug was given. Uh, medicine will become more personalized uh, based upon um, uh, quantitative analysis and uh, and and uh, other aspects. Uh, somebody was saying something uh, in the chat window. I'm, I'm about to uh, finish. Uh, and what's the future roadmap? So in my opinion, we, we are at the brink of a revolution. So uh, we are looking at health assistance in your pocket, uh, which will uh, take care of your blood pressure, which report your sugar, um, and which, which can actually take corrective actions as well in, in cases where um, things are going bad. For instance, in diabetes, uh, almost 10% of uh, populations in the, in the West, in UK, Germany, America are diabetic, right? Right now, so it's millions of people. So if um, if the if the blood sugar level goes high, um, uh, it, it very di very dire things can happen like loss of sight, loss of kidney, uh, stuff like that. But a, a, a correct dosage of insulin at the right time can save a lot of misery uh, and a lot of uh, pain um, uh, for the patient. So uh, th these things are going to become common. Uh, precise dosage. Dosage has become, rather than uh, a doctor giving you multiple milligrams of, of antibiotics that, that harm um, other parts of your body, uh, th these things are going to become more precise, exact dosage with exact, uh, based on genetic information. As I said, community healthcare, where you would use um, AI and software to track um, disease uh, spread. And, and, use, uh, uh, and use technology to track their spread and prevent um, things like COVID-19 epidemics and pandemic. Um, treatment planning would become more AI supported and, and the follow-ups follow would be more um, quantitative using computing. And finally, we'll have things like optimal drugs where, the, where special drugs would be created uh, for population groups and uh, even individuals uh, specific to that person. So that's all for today, folks. Uh, thank you for listening to me, and uh, and I'm I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ahmad Qureshi. Uh, it was AI expert from, from Philips UK. Uh, anyone present from audience side? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmad. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, we would like to invite uh, Dr. Nuruddin Hokel, and that is a uh, data scientist in Suffix, uh, Governorate, Tunisia. Please, uh, Dr. Nuruddin, join us. Uh, hello and welcome uh, to uh, everyone attending uh, this presentation on um, dealing with cold start problem when building text, text classification. Uh, models. So uh, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, so uh, let me first uh, introduce myself uh, to you. I'm uh, an NLP uh, ADEPT uh, and data science uh, expert. Uh, I hold a PhD in computer science. I'm an entrepreneur and co-founder and CEO of uh, Datasphera. Uh, Datasphera is a startup incorporated in uh, Tunisia. So uh, here I will present uh, a part of our story here in uh, the Datasphere startup. So let's start with the challenge. So uh, many of the NLP and AI startups need to build a, a certain number of models to bootstrap their activity. Here in the Datasphere, we needed uh, more than 20 AI models to uh, bootstrap our activity, uh, which is centered on customer experience uh, monitoring. Actually, we are uh, a startup working on uh, 
uh, monitoring uh, help desk conversations. So uh, the most common type of uh, models we produce is uh, supervised binary classification uh, models, which are models that can uh, like classify uh, text in two uh, categories. For example, uh, classifying emails as spams or not uh, spams or normal mails. Uh, the issue here, or the challenge, that uh, we need uh, for this go to a lot of data. So, like thousands and thousands of lablet uh, samples of data. But uh, in reality, we don't have that much. In reality, we have as little as uh, a couple uh, dozen of labeled samples. Uh, here, each customer, each of our customers, for example, each one will want to classify the con he, uh, uh, their conversations uh, depending on uh, uh, their needs and not uh, ours. So uh, they are wanting to categorize, for example, for urgency or uh, for issues or for... Uh, uh, sentiments, special sentiments and emotions, or for products or for services. So here they want to annotate a few dozen uh, samples and get working uh, models. So our approach uh, was to use data augmentation techniques to cope with this problem, which is the cold uh, start problem. So we are starting from like a few dozen samples instead of a, a couple thousand uh, samples. So I will share with you some experiments uh, we started with when uh, we start building binary models with scarce uh, data. So uh, actually, our clients want to uh, annotate or tag a very minimal number of samples uh, here, like 30 or 40 or maximum 50 samples, because it's a um, very hard work, expert work, human work. It's, it needs a lot of time. So uh, the number of annotated samples is very interesting here. So we started with uh, 30 uh, samples. Uh, we started training models on 30 samples. And as you can see, we, we didn't get nothing. So uh, as you see, uh, we get models with uh, 0 0.5 uh, accuracy, which means nothing, absolutely nothing. But we uh, here, you, you can notice that with 40 to 50 uh, samples, things get, get gets better. So uh, here, we started to get some substantial uh, result with, uh, with many uh, techniques to build the, uh, the models. As you can see here with linear classifiers, we get better results with just uh, 50 uh, samples. Uh, here, as you can uh, notice, we use a lot of uh, characteristics. So we change, we change features to get better results. Yeah, here, as you can see, we picked uh, like a, a technique, some techniques uh, depending on accuracy, but without very good substantial uh, result. So we moved to uh, the approach or the technique we used here uh, to get better uh, models, which is data augmentation. So I will present briefly 
the data augmentation technique. So here it's a, a number of techniques uh, that, uh, that are used to uh, create more data samples from uh, a little uh, number. So for example, here we can use synonym replacement, uh, random deletion, random swap, random uh, insertion and back translation, which are a lot of uh, techniques so we can inflate the, the very minimal number of samples we have. Like uh, from 50 samples, we can get like 300 samples, like inf inflate uh, by, by uh, a factor of six. And here uh, we apply those data augmentation techniques like in, se in sequence or sometimes uh, randomly. So we get, we get here uh, the results after, after data augmentation. So uh, starting from 30 samples, from 40 samples, from 50 annotated samples. And here uh, you can see that the difference, the difference uh, get uh, short between uh, the, the, the different uh, features. Yeah, uh, so uh, here we can get like uh, substantial, substantial as you can see we have uh, 0 0.74, 0 0.074 uh, accuracy for our models with uh, 50 uh, samples, so, uh, and we have like the maximal, uh, the maximal accuracy is 0 0.77, uh, starting from just uh, 50 samples. Yeah, just the comparison of the final uh, results of using just four uh, classifiers. Uh, we conduct another experiment uh, starting from a public uh, data set, uh, binary, uh, binary data set, binary classification problem. And here, as you can see, we get also uh, better, uh, considerable uh, and noticeable uh, result uh, after after the data augmentation. As you can see, we vary uh, the characteristics, the features, we vary the technique, and uh, of course, we vary the uh, data augmentation uh, technique. So, Finally, this is the, um, the comparison of uh, model performance uh, before and after uh, applying uh, the data augmentation. And uh, as you can see, we get, we get a significant uh, performance uh, boost. So uh, from uh, this uh, experiment, those experiments actually, uh, we can uh, state that uh, for us, starting with as little as 50 labeled samples can produce models with uh, minimum acceptable accuracy. Actually, uh, we work with uh, an incremental process, so we bootstrap our customer, uh, we bootstrap the, the, the construction, the building of models for our customer with just with just starting from 30 to 50 samples annot annotated samples and then of course we increment uh, this every time uh, we have new samples we we we, uh, we augment this and we build and we push uh, better uh, models but the challenge here actually is to uh, is to give a working model uh, for the customer as soon as uh, possible. 
Here, easy data augmentation uh, helped us uh, boost model accuracy. And uh, the final, uh, how to say, uh, the final wisdom from this, uh, from our story, from this presentation is that startups uh, can push models to production with minimal annotation effort from the customer or from part-time annotators. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Noruddin. Uh, he was data scientist uh, from Suffix, uh, Governorate, Tunisia. Uh, anyone questions from audience side, please? Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, Dr. Noruddin, um, uh, have you tried uh, this in, with Arabic uh, or is it mainly uh, with English? And then also, uh, what about crowdsourcing for acquiring uh, labeled data? Yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, the first is like, uh, have you tried this with Arabic? Um, and, and the second question is, um, what about the uh, crowdsourcing to acquire labels? Yeah, okay. So uh, for the first question, actually we work on uh, multiple uh, languages and uh, to be precise, we work on three languages, English, French, and Arabic. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, what we uh, notice it is uh, that uh, models, of course, uh, English, uh, models for English, generally the accuracy is much more like uh, in the 90s, okay? Uh, even more than 95% accuracy. But, but it's not the case for languages like uh, French and Arabic, uh, which uh, for, for, for English, for, for French, for example, the accuracy is in the 80s. For Arabic, the accuracy also is in the first 80s. So we get uh, good results, substantial results using uh, data augmentation techniques with those uh, languages because there is no uh, data sets, there is no uh, open uh, data sets for them. Uh, for using the annotators, uh, the, here the, the, the challenge is that uh, we have a security uh, challenge because uh, our customers don't, don't want uh, their data to be shared with anybody uh, mm. just for, for, for uh, data security. And, and then uh, it's, it needs money. So they, they need to uh, give money for annotators and then it needs human expertise. So annotation here is really customer oriented. So it needs a very specific, specific, specific special uh, experience to uh, get gold standard annotation. So uh, we, we choose this path to, uh, to enable the customer to start with minimal, with minimal uh, samples and uh, uh, then he can increment and get better uh, models. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nuruddin Lokal, uh, for such a productive information sharing with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Sarak Rishi. Uh, please, Dr. Sarak Rishi, uh, join us. researchers, academicians, and industrial representatives. Uh, so after a few minutes, our closing ceremony will start.
and now this presentation session will be uh, closed and after two uh, minutes we will start the closing session i thank you on the behalf of uh, islamic university bahawalpur pakistan department of computer science islamic university bahawalpur pakistan department of software engineering islamic university bahawalpur pakistan to all our uh, respected uh, participants and our speakers uh, their contribution is uh, in our webinar is tremendous and we uh, are thankful to all of our uh, speakers for their uh, time and for their presentations and sharing the knowledge and experience with our uh, faculty persons with our students and with our researchers thank you once again so much nice. जी आप लोगों की इनपुट है तो बताए जो नए हमारे फैकल्टी मेंबर्स है क्या किया हमने पूरा दिन शेयर कर रहे हैं बस दस